Assalamu alaikum everyone. Today I am joined by Dr. Fajri Matahati Muhammadin, who is a lecturer and researcher at the Department of International Law, Fakultas Hukum at the Universitas Gaja Mada in Indonesia. He completed his undergraduate law degree from Universitas Gaja Mada, his LLM in International Law from the University of Edinburgh, and his PhD at the International Islamic University in Malaysia. His research interests include public international law, the dialectics between Islamic international law and modern international law, international human rights law, and international humanitarian law. Thank you for being here, Dr. Fajri. It's good to see you. Pleasure is mine. Nice to see you as well. Before I begin uh, the conversation, I just wanted to gain some insight into how you actually got into the field of Islamic international law. What prompted this particular interest of yours? And how have you found navigating a career spe specifically in uh, the academia in this field? Yeah, Allah brings us to certain directions in the unlikeliest of circumstances. I was doing my master's in Edinburgh. It was 2013. I intended to learn about, you know, focus on international criminal law or something. Suddenly, 2013 was when ISIS started, you know, showing on the headlines. Suddenly, like everyone kept on asking us questions. And then I decided I need to learn more about this stuff so I can answer when people uh, ask. Then I decided to write a, a master's dissertation on the on the issue. And yeah, that's where it started. It simply snowballed from there. <laughs> All right. Yeah, and, you, and you've been working in the field ever since and how you found it so far? Yeah, I mean, there is much room to explore, alhamdulillah. It's quite enjoyable and concerning at the same time. But yeah. Here we are, I guess. No, no, it's great to see people, um, you know, venturing into this field. I think it's a very understudied field of both international law and Islamic law. Um, and I so agree. I think scholarship is very much needed. And I think that's also why we're, you know, uh, we're ho hosting this symposium in order to just just to get the word out there that, you know, study, um, studies are being done in the field and that further efforts will be much appreciated from students and academics around the world. I wanted to sort of uh, touch upon a recent paper that you wrote and presented at a conference. Um, and this paper was uh, your critical analysis of the primary sources of international law um, from an Islamic law lens. So you analyze um, treaty law, customary international law, general principles, yes, Kogans, et cetera, um, from the perspective of Islamic law, which I found pretty interesting. Um, could you briefly explain and um, you know your analysis and compare the sources of law, both in international law and Islamic law? And um, again, like we've mentioned, there's very little work, or maybe not very little work, but I think it's generally a very uh, underrepresented field in the intersection of both Islamic law and international law. Um, so what is your take on um, you know the, the role of international law, particularly in Islamic jurisprudence or fiqh. Okay, thank you. So, I mean, one thing I found when I was looking into um, the existing literature is that a lot of works on Islam and international law are very, either very superficial in explaining, you know, in Islam, we recognize treaties. In Islam, you know, we have good faith and, you know, we follow customs. But they're not really, you know, these work, contemporary works on Islamic international law, they don't go really deep into the character of contemporary sources of international law and what to do with them. You know, like, uh, I mean, like to, to talk about the whole paper would be uh, very long, but like um, I feel um, we need more in-depth analysis on the characters of modern sources of international law, like treaties, for example. Um, in the past century, we have more lawmaking treaties um, that, that are, you know, basically coloring and shaping the way of international law. So I think other than simply restating again and again that treaties are binding in Islamic law again and again, I think a strong emphasis needs to be made where Islamic nations would need to, number one, they need to filter and critically analyze every single treaty to what extent can they accept it? And the second is, to what extent can they participate in its making? Because um, all Muslims believe that Islam has solutions for everything. And yeah, I dare say that should be true. The question is, are we advocating that in the making and negotiation of treaties? 
I think, yeah, yeah, I mean, there are some efforts in that regard, but not so much if we look at the records. So basically what I think is, um, other than just saying that we uh, Muslims are bound by treaties, I think a strong emphasis needs to be on one, filtering uh, treaties in the sense that uh, Muslim nations and scholars must work together to filter and critically analyze uh, lawmaking treaties. To what extent can we, if we can at all, accept certain lawmaking treaties? Uh, that's number one. And second is, in the making of this treaty, states, uh, Muslim states and scholars must work hand in hand to participate in the making of international law by promoting Islamic solutions for global problems. This, I mean, we have some scholars dedicated in, like in my country, we have scholars dealing with renewable energy, for example. What is the fiqh of renewable energy? But that's just like uh, academic works. But like, how do we advocate that to be part of lawmaking treaties? Now, I think there, there are some efforts in that regard, but not much. If you look at the, the records of ILC, the International Law Commission discussion records, for example, you don't see that much of it. We need more of that, for example. So I believe that's um, a more contemporary approach that Islamic nations and scholars need to do in with regard to primary sources of international more participation and more filtering. Okay, you know, I think that's that's pretty uh, uh, it's pretty interesting that uh, you pointed this out, and it actually was it kind of sort of answers my next question um, on how Muslim states should approach um, you know these different sources of international law. So you talked about treaty law. Uh, could you comment on things like uh, customary law and um, even Yas Kogans, for example? Okay, right. I mean, generally, I mean, from the Sharia, one thing we need to uh, uh, go back one step to think about is there is only one true source of law, which is Wahi or revelation. And everything else, what we often call as secondary sources, are basically ways of ijtihad, ways we apply the Quran and Sunnah in various fields. Now, um, when we speak of customs, customary international law, for example, that is simply a state needs to adapt to the behavior of the society, the way an individual needs to do the same in, in their surroundings. So um, this need, there needs to be two directions of um, um, an Islamic state and scholars participation here. On one hand, they need to take what's good and not take what's bad. And also, they need to participate in shaping a positive one, a positive custom, for example. Now, meanwhile, you mentioned also about uh, Yuskogans. Now, that is a very contemporary invention. Um, Yuskogans, basically, um, for those uh, who might not know, it's like some call it the God norm, despite not literally coming from God. So it's basically a law that is recognized to be higher than everything else. Yeah, above sovereignty, above treaties, and above everything. Now, that is something that, on one hand, is recognized in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, for example, ratified and acknowledged by many Muslim states. But that is a concept that is not consistent with Islamic teachings. Because in Islamic teaching, it is a basic, not just principle of law, but tenet of faith that... The only one who has legislative powers is Allah, God. So to recognize something above that, that is against a foundation of Islamic belief. So in that respect, or what I think is we can do two things at the same time. One, we categorically reject the notion of use comments. Well, as, as you know, from a state level, it might be a bit too late for that. But I mean, at least as far as scholarship goes, the, the category of Yuskogans needs to be rejected. But on the other hand, the contents of Yuskogans, like, for example, the prohibition of, against genocide, the prohibition against um, war crimes, you know, those certain things, we can talk about that. Yeah? We can also, there are a lot of these norms that can be acceptable in Islam as well. We can follow that to some extent, but we must not recognize that as a norm above the Sharia.
So that's the way I think we need to respond to use codes. I don't think I found any works yet discussing Islamic law and use codes. So yeah. I think it's pretty uh, it's pretty insightful that you mentioned how the norm conflicts between Islamic law and international law, particularly in terms of uh, which source of law is higher or which source of law is, you know, the one that dictates the lower sources of laws. Um, I think that's pretty insightful because there are two different perspectives, particularly uh, when we compare international law to Islamic law. And Islamic law, like you mentioned, there is only one main source of law, and that is the that is a sort of uh, check and balance on the rest of the sources of law that come underneath it. Uh, whereas in international law, of course, like you said, um, you know, there are many ways in which states can essentially choose not to agree with um, in international law. We have, for example, you can simply just choose not to sign a treaty. You can choose to lodge a reservation or a declaration. Um, you can be a persistent objector when it comes to customary international law. You can outrightly deny that a yes Kogan's norm exists. Um, so uh, there are ways in which you know states may be able to maneuver their way out of certain obligations under international law. But like you said, the same may not necessarily be uh, the case with um, Islamic law because there is no sort of mechanism in which you can maneuver your way out of certain obligations. Um, just taking just taking this thought process forward, I want to transition into a discussion of human rights and how they are seen under both international law and Islamic law, a comparative perspective. I believe your perspective uh, is completely different, i.e. that there is no comparable concept of human rights as we see it in Western positive law, um, in Islamic law, but that the the nature of rights and obligations um, between people and between God make it entirely different. So uh, in your view, what is the relationship between international human rights law and Islamic human rights or Islamic rights in general from a from a jurisprudential perspective? Okay, right. Now, this is going to be a very controversial take, but on a very detailed operational level, there may be a lot of intersections. Like, for example, in Islamic law as well as human rights, you don't just kill someone for the fun of it, yeah? I mean, and, you know, starving people need to be guaranteed that they're not starving anymore, for example, yeah? So on an operational level, there may be some um, intersections, probably some uh, contradictions, obviously, but in terms of foundational concept, I believe they cannot be any further apart because, um, there are a few things that are very fundamental to human rights um, that is simply contradictory to Islam. For example, in human rights, the idea is that the rights are inherently uh, belonging to humans and it's not given. It's not given. Meanwhile, in Islam, um, anything that humans have is simply a mercy from Allah. Yeah, so um, we've got nothing if not given by Allah. And that basic foundational um, difference, it, it makes so much differences. Yeah, for example, on who gets to take away rights? To what extent do you have the capacity to claim rights, for example? There are many derivative issues that um, is uh, will emerge as a result from that. And also the issue with rights and obligations. Um, well, people in, 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 in human rights, basically the things that are inherent and etc., that's just rights. Yeah, You don't say that people have inherent obligations by the mere virtue of being a human. We don't. Yeah, But in Islam, now there are two ways people go about this. Some say we have a balance of rights and obligations. I like to prefer to say that we, we start from obligations. We start from obligations. Like, for example, I, I, I like to challenge people. If anyone can give me one dalil of rights of education in Islam, you can throw something at me. That's, that's what I usually say. And I would say you will never find it because what you will have is the obligation to receive education. Yeah. This is why knowledge is divided into, for example, for example, fardu'ayn and fardu'kifayah. Right. 
Um, for example, there's that. Also, religion. Yeah, um, it is an obligation to perform religious duties instead of rights. Yeah, it will. This will affect a lot of things. Like, for example, is it okay f- for a grown-up woman just to choose not to wear a hijab? It's a religious right. So you see, if you if you portray it as a right, then you can choose to use it or not use it. But in Islam, it's an obligation. For example, it it um, these foundational differences lead to universes of differences. Although I'm not saying that there cannot be any harmony uh, between the two. Yeah, meaning to a large extent, it's not that Islamic law cannot. Um, uh, learn certain things in terms of details. Like, for example, as much as Islam and feminism are foundationally um, uh, contradictory in a lot of things, but feminists have one major strength, in my view, is that they have data. They have data, like about uh, reproductive health and, and other things. That is important for Muslims to consider. Like, for example, in making fatwas related to women issues, for example. So there are a lot of things that um, modern human rights uh, instruments can help the Sharia in its implementation and its operational details. Yeah, but basically, generally, that's that's what I think. No, it's it's very, um, I think you explained it really well that um, in, you know, in the Western political philosophy surrounding what is a right um, a lot of focus is on that rights are inherent, and we see the same language in in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and pretty much in all all of these human rights instruments that come forth, um, is that they're inherent. So you're born, you automatically have these rights. Um, but in Islam, there is a much more complex relationship of rights and obligations. And for example, you only attain certain rights once you receive a certain position in society. For example, once you're married, only then are those rights are certain rights available to you. Um, certain rights are available to sons versus daughters, particularly when we talk about inheritance. Um, but then also the obligations upon different people are also different. And those obligations are not just to each other, um, but they're also obligations to God. Like you said, um, the obligations to perform religious duties. Under Western human rights discourse, it's been uh, termed as a right to uh, religious um, beliefs and re- uh, to perform religious duties. But then how do you balance a right to um, uh, a religious duty, which, as you know, rights can be waived by the individual in some in some uh, circumstances, versus an obligation um, to perform those religious duties. And I think that dichotomy presents a very complex relationship between the two. But um, as you mentioned that a harmonious interpretation or a harmonized interpretation of, um, you know, rights or obligations under both international law and Islamic law um, is possible. Uh, I think in your paper you mentioned that um, Muslim majority states uh, or states that have at least recognized Islam to be their state religion, um, when they when they go to ratify these human rights treaties, um, they've often resorted to using reservations against the articles of these treaties, and we we see that particularly in cases of the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the Convention on the Elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, so CEDAW. But um, well, what is your stance on the use of these reservations? We know that it is a tool that is provided for under um, public international law. Um, do you think that the use of these reservations, particularly by Muslim majority states, um, can be used as, or has been used as a means for this harmonized interpretation that you speak of? Or do you think that um, it is there's a greater propensity for it being used to promote state's own, you know, uh, political self-interests. Okay, right. Uh, thank you. This is a, a really interesting question. Um, I feel that reservations is a tool that can be used um, like any other tool. Like you can use ratifications, you can use um, declarations, you can choose not to ratify a treaty, for example. It's just one among the many tools that a Muslim state has, or any state has, to um, to respond to different kinds of treaties and react in a way that best suits their interests. 
So in theory, yes, it is possible that when there is a treaty, if there is a treaty that um, they feel in, you know, the whole idea of the treaty is good, but there are parts of it that we have problems with, reservations and or declarations can be used uh, to help uh, on one hand ratify the treaty so they're not missing out on the whole idea but they make reservations to certain points yeah i mean that this is one technique now my whole stance i mean my stance is um again this is going to be very controversial but i think we never should have have ratified any of those in the first place because of uh, because that kind of affirms the idea i mean i don't see anything wrong with <coughs> taking some beneficial provisions without even ratifying like indonesia in our human rights court act we take some provisions from the rome statute and we don't even ratify it. yeah i mean it's been done yeah by ratifying you you affirm the whole the, the idea which in my view is uh, fundamentally contradictory to islam but it's done yeah so sometimes it's not always ideal yeah we do um uh, the next best thing is to mitigate harm is we need a careful a very careful consideration to what extent um certain treaties are bad for um muslim nations to reduce the harm and here i believe some states are doing a very good job pakistan included in making reservations to like the iccpr and cedaw for example and here i point big fingers at my own country for only ratifying the compulsory dispute settlement mechanism yeah um so um we i mean like these states are doing their best yeah in reducing in, in reducing what um what harm that these human rights treaties may go although there's more that needs to be done like for example in reservations to cedaw um naturally there are some states which just happen to be mostly european they reject the reservation i think uh, our textbooks need to make it a point that the majority are silent about these reservations because the existing textbooks seem to make a big deal out of the rejections despite that being only i don't know a dozen couple of dozen states yeah so yeah i mean it could be a tool and states need to be careful yeah in analyzing individual treaties in, in that regard yeah that that's what i think okay i think that that itself is a very interesting take um but maybe if let me just throw a bit of a curveball at you um in your opinion do you think it's better for muslim states to either not ratify a particular human rights treaty or ratify it and then not implement it for fear of it being um you know Con, uh, contradictory to islam and then does that change for example the religious obligations upon a state to um you know to fulfill its obligations to other states i don't know i'm 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 no expert on international islamic law but would there be some sort of an obligation um derived from fiqh on um on states or state leaders to respect their international obligations in so far as for example they are of course um uh, they conform to uh, islamic injunctions that's a very interesting question yeah a very interesting question because it leads to another issue if an a muslim state ratifies a treaty or accepts it or you know whatever mechanism which content contradicts the sharia is that treaty even valid under the sharia there's that issue on one hand and you know that you know you can even go down the rabbit hole even further how does that fare under invalidity of treaties in the vienna convention for example yeah there's that on the other hand we pledged like this is an issue of amana as well 
This is an issue of Amana. So um, in my view, personally, it would have been better to not have ratified it at all. Yeah, as I may have mentioned earlier. Yeah. And if it is still politically possible for those who have ratified it, get out of it. Yeah. But I mean, obviously, um, you know, things have happened. Yeah. Now, what is the important job of scholars and also states here is, especially for states, is to, you know, fear Allah and like really, really consider that it's not just the upcoming elections that they need to worry about, but it's Maliki al Muddin. They need to fear Allah in that regard. Yeah. And they need to consult the scholars more. Because in my country, they're obviously not consulting the ulama. Yeah. I mean, we don't have that system, you know, where, you know, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs would consult with um, the ulama because that's an entirely different department. Yeah. Uh, that's one. And second is what we need to do, especially this is the job of the ulama, is to play, maybe uh, playing is not the a better word, for it, is, but to engage in the battle of interpretation. So um, too long has a Eurocentric and secular interpretation been considered as mainstream sim um, simply because, because of what? It's them making the textbooks. We need a more, um, a more plural, if they want to put it that way, or a term I would prefer is a more Sharia compliant um sharah of these international conventions yeah so um at least from an international perspective we can argue that this is an interpretation of the conventions based on the sharia which was our terms of accepting them in the first place for example so um we would not call it um not implementing or violating Rather, we would call it as this is our interpretation of it. Yeah, may maybe that could be a way, uh, one of the ways out. Probably. I mean, we've seen wild interpretations now and then. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Quail is on the rise. So, let's see how far they're willing to push it. Yeah, definitely. Um, following on from that thought, uh, we know that. Um, a semblance of an effort has been made, um, or it was made in 1990, I believe, when the Organization of Islamic uh, for Islamic Cooperation, the Organization for Islamic Cooperation, um, drew up a um, uh, a Cairo Declaration on Human Rights, um, and it was basically uh, to say that okay, we acknowledge that the UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, exists. But this is our version of it, and this is our Sharia compliant, to, uh, to take your words, Sharia compliant version of the UDHR. Um, do you think that, like the UDHR advanced or progressed into a more robust system of you know, binding international human rights treaties, do you think there's any scope for the Islamic world to, to take that step for themselves and essentially replace um, you know, the ICCPR, the ICESDR, and all other treaties um, under um, international law, and just make like a, a, a mini lateral sort of human rights system that applies just to them. Okay, right. Um, so there's always this interesting analogy that I use whenever I'm asked about the Cairo Declaration. Um, so Surely we should know there is a big difference between a proper Hyderabadi curry and a Maggi with Hyderabadi curry flavor. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we do appreciate the OIC. Maybe that's the best I could have thought of at that time. Yeah. And not to mention, it's recently recognized by the ILC as well, yeah, the International Law Commission, as one of the diverse uh, instruments of human rights. But academically speaking, I mean, it's been criticized strongly by both sides. Like um, the secularists say it's not human rights enough. 
And from the other side, which I, I would agree with, is it's not Islamic enough. Because it's like a Western human rights secular construct in a lot of ways, given a sprinkle of Islamic flavor and some MSG. So um, it's not quite there yet, but it's something. If only anyone actually is using that, yeah? I mean, it might be a um, it might be a good stepping stone to um, build on more things. I mean, the OIC is I don't know what they're doing, you know. I mean, other than giving scholarship, that, that's nice, by the way, giving scholarships. But I mean, they set out to deal with Palestine, but you know, they're only doing the occasional condemnation and then back to giving the scholarships. Their Majma al Fiqh al Islami is doing a good job. Like, why don't they build on something? The members don't seem to refer to the Cairo Declaration as much either. So, I mean, and this, this is where an Australian scholar, Professor Salim Farah, he wrote an interesting article on basically um, regretting why the OIC is not taking a forefront in like building an Islamic contribution to international law, okay? So, I mean, with, you know, I mean, no one's perfect, yeah? I mean, the OIC has something, but if only people could build up on that, build up more momentum, unfortunately, we're not seeing it so far. Yeah, but I mean, if only, yeah, <laughs> basically that. No, I think uh, I, I think I take your point. Um, you know, the CDHR has not really been taken forward, and um, I think we're seeing that um, you know maybe the OIC is preoccupied with other things, and um, there is a sense of fragmentation in the in the Islamic world. And I think if we are to uh, if we are to even imagine a world where you know, we can have a sort of minilateral human rights system. You need to first agree on, you know, the very basics of, of what human rights are, of what Islamic interpretations we agree on. Um, so I think there's definitely uh, room for that. Um, just uh, to conclude, um, I think I've learned a lot just from this uh, brief conversation about Islamic international law. It's a field that I've not personally explored myself, but um, what would you say to people who uh, may be interested in the field and who want to, um, you know, expand their research uh, capacity in um, Islamic international law? Yeah, please do. Please do. I really highly encourage um, goodwilled Muslims, especially those who have background uh, in the Sharia, learning the Sharia, or maybe those who are already well versed in international law to learn about the Sharia to then combine because really i mean there is so much that needs to be explored and it's so hard to find someone who's on the same page in this so like um i really do highly encourage um more people to join in with this yeah i mean like um like for example my own works i do i've written quite a bit on the issue I haven't found anyone who's criticizing. I mean, not that I'm saying therefore I'm cool, but then like dialectics is how knowledge grows, right? I mean, even that was how international law in Islam was colored in the first place. Abu Hanifa debating with Al Awza'i and then Al Shaibani came up. It's dialectics that shapes knowledge. So more people on board, we can achieve a lot we can achieve a lot. So I really highly recommend uh, people to start joining in this. Plus there's prospect. In the international law movements of um, of the of TWAIL, Third World Approaches to International Law, even non-Muslim scholars are saying, hey, Muslims should be given platform too. Yeah, but then what materials do we have? I mean, we, we have materials on a lot of things but ready to be used materials for immediate issues, we still need to develop things a bit further before it's ready to be used. 
in a contemporary international law context. So there's a necessity for it. There's a market for it. So yeah, what are we waiting for? Okay. That, that, that's what I think. Yeah, no, I think that's a great note uh, to end this. What are we waiting for exactly? Um, I, I would just like to say thank you. I think this is a this was a wonderful conversation, and um, uh, I hope that you know it inspires a lot of people um, to to take up a uh, study in the field and to engage more with the academia around Islamic international law, um, both from the FIC perspective and also from um, the international law traditional international law studies. Perspective. Thank you so much, Dr. Faji, for your time. It was uh, wonderful having you, and we hope to you know, keep uh, working with you in the future. Um, thank you to the audience for watching this, uh, and we hope you continue to watch our future episodes as well.